with that, uh, I think I'll try to get our, our main talk started. So as I said, this is uh, the seminar of the Joint Quantum Institute in the Physics Department at UMD. And we are thrilled today to have a slightly unusual speaker. So we have Professor Charles Pfefferman from the math department at Princeton University. Um, and so he is most famous for two things, winning a Fields Medal and teaching me multivariable calculus uh, <laughs> and linear algebra actually. And so, but so today he's here under a sort of, I would say a mathematical physics hat that he's been doing a lot of work recently on rigorously proving uh, problems in sort of materials physics. So both 1D topological models and today he's going to talk to us about work that he has done in uh, graphene. Um, and so with that, I'll hand it over to Charlie and he can, he can tell us amazing things. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, that is to say the time, uh, the time is available if I have amazing things to say, we shall see. Um, uh, I'm delighted and uh, nervous about being here. This, this is the University of Maryland, my alma mater. Uh, when, when, the, um, when Alicia invited me, uh, it, the, it, it melted my heart. Um, uh, Alicia and I are old friends and, and the University of Maryland, I mean, okay. Um, now, uh, let's see, uh, the nervousness arises because I'm talking to uh, a mixed audience of, of physicists and mathematicians. Uh, I know remarkably little physics. I'm very relieved to see that my co-author, uh, Michael Weinstein, uh, is, is here to answer any questions you might have uh, with, with physical content. Okay, so in particular, I'm gonna be talking about joint work with Michael and with James Lee Thorpe, who I think is probably not here. Um, okay, uh, now we're going to be studying Schrodinger operators acting on functions on the plane uh, R2, uh, and these the, uh, the relevant potentials are periodic with a very, very special period lattice. And the period lattice is going to, um, is going to provide interesting uh, properties of uh, the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of, of the Schrodinger operator. So for physicists, this is all familiar. We're, we're talking about graphene. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show a picture or two in a minute. Uh, we're going to be proving mathematical theorems on the most basic electronic properties of graphene and related materials. Namely, they, they have Dirac points and edge states. Uh, for, for, for the mathematicians who, who perhaps uh, do number theory, um, uh, a, a Dirac point is a point where some surface, which we will talk about, um, uh, looks locally like a cone and that has physical consequences, uh, very important about, about how electrons pass through the material. Um, then there are edge states in which electrons uh, stick close to an edge without, I mean, and resisting the temptation to diffuse into, into the two-dimensional material. Okay, now physicists have um, heuristic calculations, which we'll talk about. Uh, they apply typically when the potential is very strong or very weak. And in that case, at least if you don't worry about justifying the approximations, you can make approximations. So what I have in mind is that we're going to justify the heuristic calculations, okay? And also discuss what happens when the potential is of medium strength, neither very strong nor very weak. That's the plan. Okay, so what is this very special lattice? Well, here is the honeycomb structure, okay? So imagine, Imagine uh, a tiling of the plane by regular hexagons. There's my attempt to draw regular hexagons. At each dot, imagine that there is a carbon atom. Um, okay, that's, that's graphene. Uh, that's one layer of graphite. Uh, I, have, uh, I have colored the, um, the carbon atoms uh, with two colors, red and green. Uh, so there are two kinds of points uh, called A points or B points. That just means red or green in the picture. And, uh, but, but that's a mathematical convenience that we'll use later. Uh, carbon atoms are just carbon atoms. Okay, if we look only at the red points uh, and if we pick out one of the red dots, let's say that one as the origin, then in fact, this forms a lattice in, uh, um, in the plane that is a, a discrete uh, uh, rank two uh, uh, group of, of um, uh, vectors. Uh, and, and here I've, I've shown on the slide in coordinates 
in full glory the um, the two vectors that I'm picking out as uh, basis vectors for the lattice. Uh, uh, these slides are zipping by. There are a lot of them, each with almost no information. Uh, please feel very free to interrupt me if anything is unclear. So far, I think uh, uh, people may put their head in their hands uh, at how elementary this is, but I don't think anyone is snowed. All right, so we have a lattice. Uh, there is the dual lattice of all vectors with the property that when you take the inner product with, um, with something in the physical lattice, the, the red dots, that you get two pi times an integer. And, and here, here is the basis uh, written out for, for the dual lattice. And here, here is a, a, a fundamental domain for the dual lattice. So um, these are all the vectors in the plane that are closer to the origin than to any other point of the dual lattice. And so this is called the Brillouin zone, and, and it's a, a standard object in, in solid state physics. And, uh, uh, and, and so um, the, the, uh, when you're doing Fourier analysis uh, uh, on, the, on the Schrodinger operator, uh, the, the Brillouin zone is going to play a role. Okay, now uh, uh, what's special about the honeycomb lattice? Uh, why is it different from all, why is this lattice different from all other lattices? Well, the honeycomb lattice and its dual lattice and the Brillouin zone and the red and green dots, all of that are invariant under a rotation uh, of by 180 degrees, which I'm, and I'm going to call that rotation R, okay? And a fundamental observation that underlies the theorems is that if you look at one of the corners of the Brillouin zone, uh, uh, let's say the top, uh, the top corner. Uh, Charlie, a question. You meant yes. 120. You meant 120, not 180, right? Oh, what did I say? 180? Oh dear. Yes, 120. Thank you. Oh dear. Uh, let's. That's okay. Let's... I just wanted to make sure. I thought you yes, misspoke, yes. but you are the mathematician, so I have to make sure that. Thank you very much. I, I hope have to accept rest... whatever you say. <laughs> I, I hope the rest of my comments are more accurate than that one. Thank you. Okay. Yes, it's a 120 degree rotation. Okay, and so if we look at the, uh, again, at the Brillouin zone, where'd it go? Um, there, there's the Brillouin zone. If you look at the red dots, there's an obvious 120 degree rotation, but let's say carries K to, I forget which one, let's say to that guy, and then to that guy, maybe I got it backwards. Um, and, and so uh, there's, there's the observation and the proofs, which by and large, I'm not going to show you, uh, make fundamental use of that. Okay, so there, ah, okay, um, there's, there's the relevant picture. Okay, now we're going to do elementary Fourier analysis of the action of lattice translation on wave functions uh, for, for, for this uh, Hamiltonian minus Laplacian plus V. Uh, physicists call that block theory. Um, and, and I've been uh, advised by, by Alicia not to spend too much time on it. So I hope this is appropriately pruned for each for each vector k in the Brillouin zone, one can define k periodic wave functions. So that's, that's a function on the plane, which when you translate it by a lattice element, uh, well, would be periodic, except that it has a phase factor and there's the phase factor and there sits the vector k. And so k is called a quasi-momentum. And that's, that's a very natural name uh, uh, coming from physics. Let's just, uh, uh, I mean, if, if you do number theory and have never taken a physics course, don't worry about it, it's a name. Okay, now for a fixed K, there is, there is a Hilbert space of K periodic, uh, um, K pseudo periodic wave functions that are locally L2. There's a natural inner product. Part of the pruning is that I'm not going to write down the natural inner product, but there is such a thing. So for each, so quasi momenta live in the Brillouin zone, for each quasi-momentum, there is a Hilbert space of things with the appropriate variant of periodicity uh, arising from that K. Uh, and the, on that Hilbert space, each, uh, uh, well, all right. That, all right, that, those Hilbert spaces will be basic. We'll be talking about them. Um, every, <coughs> every, wave function, <coughs> every wave function on the whole plane can be uh, decomposed as an integral of pseudo-periodic wave functions. And the Hamiltonian uh, acts separately on each of these, and that's guaranteed by elementary Fourier analysis. It follows that the spectral theory of the Hamiltonian reduces to the spectral theory of the restriction of the Hamiltonian to each of these uh, L2K. Okay, so for each, for each K, uh, let's say H sub K is our Hamiltonian restricted 
to that space of, of k pseudo periodic wave functions. For each k, that hk has a discrete spectrum. And we're going to be interested in the eigenvalues written with accounted according to multiplicity and in increasing order, OK? Uh, and they depend on k. And those are interesting functions of k, very important functions. They are called dispersion relations. Uh, and their graphs, their three-dimensional surfaces are called dispersion surfaces. So given a, a, a K in the Brillouin zone, we form the Hamiltonian appropriate to things pseudoperiodic uh, with quasi-momentum K. And then for nu equals one, two, three, et cetera, E nu of K uh, is the kth dispersion function of, of K. And it's, it's uh, the corresponding surface is the kth dispersion surface. Okay, now, um, all right. Uh, when the, because the, the graph, I'm sorry, the graph, because the, the underlying lattice is that very, very special lattice, there arise Dirac points, which have uh, a fundamental physical consequences. So what is a Dirac point? Well, let's look at two, let's look at two uh, uh, successive dispersion uh, uh, surfaces. So let's pick nu naught, whatever that is, and nu naught minus one. And let's say that near the point capital K, remember capital K is the uppermost vertex of the Brillouin zone. Uh, um, let's say that, e, uh, that, that, that these surfaces look like this. That means that the graphs look, um, uh, look like cones. There's a, an upward pointing cone, and then below it, uh, a downward pointing cone. Together, they make a double cone. Uh, these these are called Dirac points. They have they've previously entered the literature. They were called conical points and diabolical points. I, I think maybe they go back to the 19th century. Uh, this number lambda zero, which gives the opening of the cone, is called the Fermi velocity. It's not exactly a cone. It's asymptotically a cone, and the approximation gets better and better as the quasi momentum approaches this this capital K, uh, and and so this this little o. Uh, means means uh, small compared to. So as as little k approaches capital K, uh, this error is not only small but small compared to that. Okay, that's what a Dirac point is. The implication of a Dirac point is that a wave packet um, describing uh, the state of an electron of a single electron with a quasi momentum concentrated near capital K travels as a relativistic free particle for a long time simply because if you look at a, rel a relativistic free particle uh, in the plane, uh, its dispersion surface is a cone. And so that's what happens. Okay, now we're going to prove theorems to justify all that. And so um, we, we're looking at honeycomb potentials. This is, I, so now what I'm doing is specifying the class of potentials which, uh, to which the theorem will apply. So uh, this V sub H is real valued uh, Michael and I assumed that it was C infinity, but that's out of laziness. We didn't want to worry about what happens with the Coulomb singularity and so on. I, I can almost write you in blood a promise that, that if you put in various kinds of singularities, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, all right, so we have, we have this, this uh, potential. Um, it is invariant under translations of the lattice, and it is invariant under rotation by 120 degrees, and it is even. One could, of course, combine these two things by saying it's invariant under rotation by 60 degrees, but these have different physical consequences. And later on, we will keep that, but drop that. So this is a convenient way to specify the potentials. Um, notice that so far, our potentials don't necessarily arise as superpositions of potentials coming from carbon atoms. They just, uh, they satisfy these symmetry properties. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, well, you might wonder now, uh, um, the potential zero uh, has all these properties. Let's, let's try to exclude the potential zero. So here's the first theorem. So let's say um, V, I guess I called it VH before. V is, let's say, a, a honeycomb potential. And let's suppose that this particular Fourier coefficient uh, applied to V it is not zero. Okay, so this, this for reasons that I don't understand, they simply come out of the logic of the proof and out of calculation, this Fourier coefficient is important. Um, okay, if that's true, then let's look at the Hamiltonian in which the potential is a coupling constant lambda times V. This Hamiltonian has a Dirac point at, at the upper vertex of the Brillouin zone 
for all lambda outside a discrete set E. Okay, now you might wonder, uh, what about this discrete set E? Uh, we, we definitely want to exclude zero because zero is not a very interesting potential. And for that matter, the, the theorem is not true for the zero potential. But it turns out that for a large class of honeycomb potentials, there is just the right uh, uh, non-zero coupling constant uh, depending on V in, for which the first, not only two dispersion surfaces meet at, at, cap, at the quasi-momentum capital K, but in fact, the first three dispersion surfaces meet at capital K. And so that, that will, I mean, the idea of the proof will come out later. I, I'm going to skip almost all details, but I'll try to give in a very vague way the idea of the, of the proof. Okay, so, um, so for all but a discrete set of E, we've got Dirac points. And for, um, uh, for, for a non-empty discrete set, we've got something more complicated than Dirac points. Okay. Now, as a consequence of that, there are wave packets that propagate almost as relativistic free particles for a long time. And so here is the, a more or less precise version of the, the statement of that theorem. So uh, we, fix, we fix a potential V as in theorem one, and we pick a coupling constant, which is not in this discrete set E. We want to solve the time dependent, I mean, the, the, the time varying Schrodinger equation. So this is, this is how wave functions evolve and, um, okay. Um, all right, uh, and a formal multi-scale calculation gives an approximate solution parametrized by a small number delta. Here's, here's how the approximate solutions look. So um, the variation with time is simply this exponential, so it's time harmonic. Um, delta is a scaling factor to give these wave functions L2 norm one Capital phi one and capital phi two are carefully selected eigenfunctions of the uh, of the time independent Schrodinger operator, but they are being multiplied by these slowly varying functions alpha j of delta x and delta t. And so these functions, if if the alphas are fixed and the delta becomes very small, then this alpha is nearly constant. Over any length, over any length scale small compared to delta, and, and uh, to one over delta, and any time small compared to one over delta. Okay, and if you plug this into the formal, uh, into a formal asymptotic expansion, you discover that what you want uh, capital alpha one and capital alpha two to do is to solve a Dirac equation, which I'll write down in a minute. The variables here are capital X and capital T. Those are the rescaled variables. So think that capital X is going to be delta times little x and capital T is going to be delta times little t. And so this, this alpha one and alpha two should solve a Dirac equation. Here is the Dirac equation. Um, and this number lambda sharp is a non-zero complex number computed from those specially selected eigenfunctions phi one and phi two. So the moral of the story is simply that, that oh, oh wait, I'm sorry. The, the, um, there's no story yet. Uh, uh, um, that's the formal calculation. Uh, and as initial conditions, we simply pick uh, smooth, uh, rapidly decreasing functions of, of position. And, and we assume that at time zero, that's what's going on. Okay, so that's the formal multi-scale calculation. And the theorem is that if you, if you do all that, and if you let C delta approximate be the approximate solution determined by those alpha one and alpha two, then there is an exact solution that, that approximates the approximate solution for a long time. And here, here's the precise statement. So the, the uh, approximate solution uh, decreases like a power of delta, maybe a small power of delta, but nevertheless, it decreases like a power of delta for a long time, not quite delta to the minus two, but, uh, uh, but, but almost and epsilon is, is at our disposal. So those are the theorems. Now these theorems- uh, Charlie, this is oh, Sean, yes. I have a question. Yes. What is the significance of the number 100 there? That's the only part I don't know in everything you told oh, me. Oh, 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 oh. Um, everything else I know. Okay, okay. So why 100? Why 100? That, that, yeah. reflects, that reflects laziness. I did not work out, uh, and Michael and I uh, did not work out the uh, uh, the best possible thing. I'm sure it's okay. not 100. All right, right. yeah, I'm, I feel better. Go on, thank you. Okay, sure, sure. Um, okay. All right. Uh, th these theorems persist under small changes in the potential and small deformations of the honeycomb lattice. Okay. But 
uh, the, the potential must be even. Okay, remember I, I warned there would be a distinction between even potentials uh, and, and, uh, and not. So um, if, we, if, we, if we perturb the lattice and perturb the potential, um, uh, but keep, but, but, uh, uh, keep thing, the potential even, instead of having a, a double right circular cone, uh, the dispersion relations look like this. Uh, these are a, these correspond to a tilted double elliptical cone. Okay, slightly perturbed off the um, uh, uh, off of the the the, um, the graphene picture, and the point at uh, the vertex of the double cone uh, perturbs slightly away from from the uh, uh, from the top of the Boulogne zone. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. Now, uh, that's what happens if V is even, but if V is perturbed a little bit so that it's no longer even, then this double cone breaks up typically into a thing like that. So it, it has maybe, um, a tip with large curvature, but not a, not a sharp tip. There is no conical point. And so that's, that's what happens at least generically. Uh, uh, another question is Sean, the yes. gap yep. that you're drawing here. Yes. Is there a gap or you're just drawing it that way? Um, all right, locally there is a gap. Globally, there may or may not be a gap and that's one of the lessons of okay. the- Okay, locally there is a gap. That, that you have proven, that's very locally, interesting. Yes, locally there is a gap, yes. Yeah, because yeah. that's what we find also, thank you. Okay, okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, okay, now, uh, uh, so far I've been discussing um, the bulk, uh, but, but edges are very interesting and I'd like to discuss now um, edge states for two different regimes. There, we're, we're going to talk about domain walls and sharply terminated uh, uh, honeycombs. So uh, we're going to start with domain walls, but let me first, uh, for, for the um, uh, people who are not familiar with, with uh, uh, solid state physics, uh, it's, it's easier to describe uh, at first a sharply terminated honeycomb. You, you take this, this lattice of, of uh, atoms, let's say, and you, you take a knife and you cut along a straight line. That separates, guess what? That separates the plane into two halves and you throw away one half and you keep the, uh, you keep the atoms in, uh, on one side of, of, the, of the knife cut and on the other side, there is simply a vacuum. And now you allow the electron to, to occupy all of space, but it is only uh, attracted to nuclei where the nuclei live and half of them are gone. That's a sharply terminated honeycomb, uh, which we will get to much later in the talk. Uh, I wonder what the rate of, uh, all right. <clears throat> I wonder what the rate of speed is. I have some huge number of slides. Let's see what will happen. Um, all right, that's, anyway, those are sharply terminated honeycombs. Now domain walls are much gentler objects. Uh, so what, what happens is that you, you, look, you, you look at the plane, you draw a straight line, and you imagine that you make uh, gentle, small changes, uh, but make them gradually so that in the limit, as you get far away from, from the edge, you, at least if you only look on one side of the edge, it looks as if nothing much, nothing much has changed. But, but if you are right near the edge, something is a little different. So that's a, a domain wall. Uh, and, and we're going to study that first. All right, well, actually, first we talk about the edges. Of course, in, in the plane, any line looks very much like any other line, but we've got a, um, we've got a plane tiled by uh, hexagons. And so the orientation of the line makes a big difference. So I'm going to show you two of the classical uh, edges that, that physicists look at in connection with uh, graphene. This is the zigzag edge, okay? So-called because the, I guess, because the, um, uh, the atoms on the frontier, the ones I've, I've colored uh, form a zigzag, okay? Uh, here's another edge. This is called the armchair edge because if you look at the uh, uh, colored dots on the frontier, uh, um, they form armchairs in which you might imagine sitting if you were about as big as the distance between atoms. So, um, okay, but of course those are only two edges. Here is, here is another rational edge. I'm calling it rational because it passes through two distinct points of, of, the, uh, of the honeycomb. Okay, that's some other rational edge. And there's no reason why an edge has to be rational. So there could be irrational. There are irrational edges. And it's very interesting to ask 
uh, okay, how do, um, what's the quantum mechanics of, of, uh, uh, of a honeycomb uh, uh, with an irrational edge? And I tell you in advance, I would love to know anything about that, but I don't. Okay. All right, so uh, the plan is first we're going to discuss domain walls, then we're going to look at sharply terminated structures. Okay, let me, let me explain the class of potentials that we'll look at for domain walls. So we're going to pick an edge, then we're going to pick a vector um, denoted by this funny K. Uh, that's a, a, think of it as a quasi-momentum. It's, it's perpendicular to the edge, okay? And we're going to use it, maybe I shouldn't think of it as, all right, it's, it's a vector perpendicular to the edge. Uh, v is a honeycomb potential in the sense of theorem one, okay? And we're going to let lambda be a coupling constant not belonging to this bad set E. So this guy has a Dirac point at capital K. But now we're going to perturb our potential lambda V in, in such a way as to produce a domain wall. To make that perturbation, we're going to take, um, we're going to take a potential W which has the translational symmetry of, uh, of, of the honeycomb, uh, but is odd rather than being even. So if we add multiples of W, we're definitely, uh, uh, you know, it's definitely no longer a honeycomb potential. Um, I'm not assuming that W has the uh, um, invariance by 120 degrees. Uh, we're going to use a small parameter delta in order to produce uh, very in order to produce small perturbations that are that occur on a very gentle uh, time scale. So uh, here, uh, I'm sorry to produce a, a formula with um, you know with zero time to think about any particular slide, but kappa is let's say the hyperbolic tangent or any function that looks like it. So it transitions smoothly from minus one to plus one, and what we're doing is we're taking our lambda v. And we're multiplying it by delta times W, that, that's the odd uh, perturbation, okay? So it's a little bit different from a honeycomb potential. And we're multiplying it by this slowly varying function kappa of uh, uh, K dot delta X. The, the fact that it's a delta X means it's slowly varying. And the fact that, the fact that it's this K which is perpendicular to the edge means that translations parallel to the edge don't affect the, this, uh, don't affect this factor. Um, and, and so, all right. Uh, um, what Charlie? do we do? Yes, sorry. Yes. It's Alicia. So one question. So does W sort of inherently unbalance the two sub lattices? So like green is lower than red on one side and red is higher than green on the other, or is, it, um, is um, that too uh, simple? Is that, uh, let's see, um, can it do that? Um, I don't think so, but but you know what? I'm not sure. M Michael, uh, I thank God Michael is here. What what do you think? Um, is, is there is there well, a difference between red and green? Thanks to this, I think my my real question is: What does a potential that has the translation symmetry of the honeycomb but is odd look like? I don't have a picture in my head. Oh 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 oh. Okay. Um, 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 hmm. I am, oh God, I'm not sure. Okay, we, we can talk about it later. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What a good question. Uh, perhaps, what, what the hell? Perhaps phase shifted uh, at phase, sh maybe phase shifted from each other at plus minus infinity. Or... Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, here's, um, I mean, here, here's, the thing to remember, okay, which unfortunately, I mean, you can see how, how little I, uh, I have thought about what these potentials are actually like, but, 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 um, uh, although this guy is not periodic, nevertheless, far from an edge, this is the way, uh, this is the way the potential looks on one side because the hyperbolic tangent is asymptotic to one for large positive values. And this is the way it looks on the other side Okay, so, so here's our edge, here's our vector k perpendicular, and uh, far from the edge, this is how the potential looks, and close to the edge, this is how the potential looks. Okay, ah, ah, okay, I, I think I can answer your question, but let me, l let me put it off because I have this mountain of slides. Okay, in the informal discussion, I'll, I'll try to 
tell you what I think is true about, about how this guy actually looks or an, an example, reasonable example. Okay, all right. Now, although, although this guy isn't exactly periodic, nevertheless, it, is, it has some translation invariant. It's translation invariant parallel to the, to the edge. So this, this red V is a, a particular vector along the edge. Let's take it to be the shortest possible such, such thing in such a way that the potential has that one dimension of translation symmetry, whereas the full, uh, a full uh, 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 honeycomb potential would have two directions of, of translational symmetry. So here's, here's a picture for the zigzag edge. I haven't bothered to color the dots, uh, but, but all right. So this is a zigzag edge. And notice that if you translate the whole picture by, by that red arrow, it, it remains the same. And so our, our potential remains the same. Okay, so uh, elementary Fourier analysis therefore decomposes wave functions, not according to quasi-momenta uh, as before, but into parallel quasi-momenta. So now a, a wave function has a given parallel quasi-momentum, this K parallel is simply a real number, and it should satisfy C plus the red vector is equal to uh, C of X, uh, but, but uh, phase shifted and the, the phase shift is the parallel quasi-momentum. Okay, that's, that's the notion of, uh, of quasi-momentum suitable for, for an edge. And uh, L2K parallel is the space of wave functions with that quasi-momentum endowed with a natural inner product. And, and again, um, uh, uh, on Alicia's advice, uh, I've, I've pruned the definition of the, of the inner product. But as in, as in the study of uh, L2K for a full quasi-momentum, uh, there are two basic facts. Any wave function can be decomposed as a superposition of wave functions with parallel quasi-momenta. And for a fixed parallel quasi-momentum, uh, our Hamiltonian maps that Hilbert space to itself, okay? And, and so in order to understand spectral theory uh, for this guy, it's enough to fix a single parallel quasi-momentum. Um, let me take a moment to, uh, to, to write down the relationship of parallel quasi-momenta to ordinary qua uh, quasi-momenta. If you fix a parallel quasi-momentum, okay, there is a natural line. It's this, uh, uh, or, well, all right. One dimensional thing in, in general, maybe a finite union of lines. Uh, but let's say we look at all we look at all the quasi momenta in the Boulogne zone for which the given real number k parallel is the dot product of our of our quasi momentum k with the red vector v modulo two pi, uh, and and in the cases we'll look at that is actually just a line segment, okay. And so any any c with the given parallel quasi momentum can be represented as a superposition of wave functions. Uh, with full quasi-momenta, where the quasi-momenta are restricted to lie on the line and we're integrating with respect to simply length on the line. Okay, so that's, the, that's that relationship. Uh, how am I doing for time? Oh dear. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, let's look at the zigzag edge and let's look at the parallel quasi-momentum for which that line segment uh, passes through the Dirac point capital K. So here's our line, there's the Brillouin zone. We're interested in, in that parallel quasi-momentum. Okay, question, are there protected edge states? Now there's this interesting word protected. I'm not going to get into it. We have results that are, that are, are sort of first cousins to what, what physicists mean when they say protected, but let me just talk about edge states. So are there edge states for the Hamiltonians we've talked about? So what is an edge state? Uh, an edge state is uh, a wave function with the particular parallel quasi-momentum uh, of interest to us now uh, in such a way that it is an eigenfunction of the, uh, of the Hamiltonian uh, with, with an eigenvector E. And furthermore, this C decreases rapidly to zero as we get away from the edge. Okay, so of course, if we propagate parallel to the edge, if we move parallel to the edge, C is simply phase shifted uh, because of its, right? It, 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 I mean, that's the definition of the parallel quasi-momentum. Going parallel to the edge, the thing doesn't decrease at all. It's just quasi-periodic. Uh, but if you move away from the edge, the, C rap the, the wave function rapidly 
uh, decreases to tends to zero, uh, which means the thing is localized near the edge. So first we're going to look at small lambda, and then we're going to pass to arbitrary lambda, which, which are not in this funny exceptional set E. Uh, we were surprised to discover that the sign of this mysterious Fourier coefficient makes a big difference. So here's what happens if, if this Fourier coefficient is positive. Let me explain what this graph is. These are energies E, possible eigenvalues. Remember our domain wall potentials depend on this small parameter delta. So for fixed delta, if you slice this, uh, this picture with, with a horizontal line, that's the spectrum of the, uh, of the relevant Hamiltonian um, for the given delta, okay? And, uh, and, and so notice it's mostly continuous spectrum, but there is this red line which bifurcates out of the Dirac point, okay? Those correspond to, I mean, those, those are, act, this is continuous spectrum, these are eigenfunctions and they are edge states, okay? The, the, uh, the, these are sort of protected in the sense that changing that function kappa, that sort of hyperbolic tangent, doesn't significantly change the picture. That's what happens if the Fourier coefficient has the right sign. If the Fourier coefficient has the wrong sign, the picture is quite different. There can be edge states, but they won't bifurcate out of the Dirac point. And if you make a change in the kappa, they will bifurcate out of someplace else. Uh, um, here's for one kappa, we've got this picture, and for another kappa, we've got that picture. Okay, and so the theorem is that if you set everything up the way I've said for the last few minutes, and if you assume also that the W is generic, if some particular linear combination that I don't remember of Fourier coefficients of W, if that's non-zero, then what we find is that this Hamiltonian has an edge state bifurcating out of the Dirac point, provided, provided that the Fourier coefficient has the right sign. If the Fourier coefficient has the wrong sign, we believe that at least uh, uh, in the typical case, at least generically, we believe that edge states don't form we have a heuristic argument that I'll explain, and we have numerical evidence, but we don't have a proof. So we'd love to have a proof, and every so often we think about it, and I don't exclude the possibility that someday we will have a proof. Okay, but I'd like to explain now why this Fourier coefficient matters for this problem, and then uh, the Fourier coefficient will play a big role uh, in showing that this strange uh, exceptional set script E is non-empty. All right, remember, um, remember these limiting potentials, uh, this, this V with a plus and the V with a minus, this is how we look far away from the edge on one side of the edge, and this is how we look far away from the edge on the other side of the edge. Um, okay, and let's see. Um, okay, now these are not the same potential, but they have the same uh, uh, spectrum, and they have the same period lattice. So they have a common set of dispersion relations, okay? Um, and so here, here, are the dispersion, uh, here are the dispersion relations, but restricted to the line. Uh, a significant point of, of analyzing this is that um, in order to understand edge states, what's important is not the whole dispersion surface, but rather the part of the dispersion surface restricted to K lying in that line. And that, that behaves somewhat differently from the behavior of the full function. So I'm going to write mu in the next couple of slides and that's simply some length parameter or something to, to identify. I mean, identifying a point on this line is equivalent to specifying a mu, okay. Now, when, when lambda, or, all right, in the regime when lambda is small and delta is even much smaller uh, than lambda, one can use elementary perturbation theory to understand uh, these dispersion surfaces restricted to the line. And I'd like to show you the pictures. So this is what happens when the, when the relevant uh, Fourier coefficient has the correct sign when it's positive. First, let's suppose that delta is zero. So we simply have a, 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 a honeycomb potential with a Dirac point. We look at its dispersion surface, but we slice that dispersion surface by restricting K to a line. Mu is that parameter uh, uh, that parameterizes the line and E is the uh, eigenvalue. And here we have a Dirac point. This is what we see from the two cones that, uh, that from the double cone that meets at this point. So this is the Dirac point. 
and notice the first two dispersion surfaces meet in a Dirac point and the third one is up there someplace else. Okay, that's when lambda is small but delta is zero. Now turn on a small perturbation and this is the picture. And what happens is that, that a small gap uh, appears. So there's a small energy gap. Um, and so that's the picture. Uh, when the Fourier coefficient has the right sign, lambda is small and delta is even smaller. What happens if, um, uh, if things are, um, what, what happens if the Fourier coefficient has the wrong sign? Again, you can work out elementary perturbation theory. If lambda is small, here's our Dirac point, okay? Notice that it's the second and third dispersion surfaces that meet at the Dirac point, and the first point, the, the first dispersion surface lies under it. And if you um, if you now turn on a non-zero delta, but small compared to lambda, this is the picture. Notice that locally, locally an energy gap forms, but globally an energy gap does not form. The, the dotted line still meets the dispersion surface uh, at these two points. So that's a fundamental difference between Fourier coefficients of the right sign and Fourier coefficients of the wrong sign. Um, and so that, that fundamental difference is, is uh, expressed by what we call the no-fold condition. So uh, E star, the energy of the, of the Dirac, uh, of the Dirac uh, point, that lies in or close to the spectrum of the operator uh, acting on L2 uh, with quasi-momentum K again, K restricted to this line, that's important. Uh, this should happen only when K equals uh, capital K um, mod, the, mod, whoop, mod the dual lattice. There. The advantage of the document camera over slides. Um, okay. Uh, so um, that happened with the, right, with the right sign of the Fourier coefficient, but not with the wrong sign. And so when, when the coupling constant lambda is small, the no-fold condition holds when lambda has uh, when when the Fourier coefficient has the right sign, but fails when it has the wrong sign. Okay. Oh dear. Um, all right. So regardless, now I, I've been talking first about small lambda, but regardless of the size of lambda, we prove that if the no-fold condition holds and some linear combination of the Fourier coefficients of W is non-zero then edge states bifurcate out of the Dirac point, okay? If the no-fold condition fails, we believe that at least generically protected edge states or well, edge, edge states bifurcating out of the Dirac point do not exist. Instead, there are metastable uh, states that decay into the bulk after a long, long time um, because they can. Uh, but does that really happen? And how long do the metastable uh, uh, edge states live? We don't know. All right, well. Charlie, quick question. Yes, yes. yes. So when you say metastable, do you mean metastable in, in time or like in distance from the edge? In, in, in time, in time. Okay, so, so, in the, so there are states, we think there are states that, that decay rapidly away from, from the edge um, and they last for a long, long time, but after eons, they decay into the bulk. Okay, so they're close to eigenstates, but not true eigenstates. And so yes. then eventually they dissolve. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. I, I have a question. I'm, I'm appalled to see that it's 1147. When should I stop talking? Um, we usually go until about noon. I think, you know, the, okay. the okay. question is sort of what punchline do you want to get to? No, 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 no. Let me, let me stop at noon. So, so when, when it's noon, uh, I, you know, I will finish the sentence and stop. Sounds okay. good. Okay, all right. So, uh, uh, so far we've been, I mean, we've, uh, well, for a while, we've been talking about small coupling constants. Now let's talk about large coupling constants, okay? There is a back of the envelope calculation due to uh, Wallace in the 1940s, which allegedly gives the limit as the coupling constant goes to infinity. It involves an undetermined parameter called the hopping coefficient, and it predicts what uh, it predicts edge states for sharply terminated honeycombs with zigzag edges, but not with armchair edges. I, I should have said the previous uh, discussion of, of domain walls was for the zigzag edge, uh, for the domain, for, for, for the honeycomb, I'm sorry, for the armchair, you, you, we don't, of course we don't assume, 
We do not assert that uh, edge states form. We believe they don't. Okay. Um, okay. If we believe that the Wallace model correctly predicts the behavior of, uh, of the one electron wave function for large coupling constants, then for large lambda, actually the sign of this Fourier coefficient that I said was so important is in fact completely unimportant. And so our, our results on, uh, on, on large coupling constant do uh, three things. They confirm the Wallace model, they identify this parameter, the hopping coefficient, and they play a key role in showing that this funny set script E uh, is not empty, that, that there are, that it can happen that, and it often does happen, that the first three dispersion surfaces meet at a Dirac point. Okay, so um, I, I think uh, every, uh, I mean, oh, all right. If, if you are a solid state physicist, you definitely know the Wallace model. If, if you are a number theorist, you probably don't know the Wallace model, so bear with me. Um, uh, so uh, uh, each, so, okay, I'm going to explain the Wallace model. How do you do a back of the envelope calculation that, that tells you what, what to think about large coupling constant? Each site omega in the honeycomb structure, uh, for, for each site, we're given one complex number. That's the amplitude associated to that site. And so a state of the system is going to be a vector whose components are all of these C omega. So there's one complex number for each site omega in the honeycomb lattice. And so that's a vector in little l2, and, and that's a state of the system, okay? Well, I've told you what a state of the system is. Now I have to tell you what the Hamiltonian is. All right, each site of the honeycomb has three nearest neighbors. Let's call them, the, the site is omega, and the three nearest neighbors are x of omega, y of omega, and z of omega. There they are, okay. So the, um, okay, in the Wallace model, the Hamiltonian is defined in the following way. Suppose that you've got a psi, that is uh, an amplitude uh, psi omega for each omega. We apply the Wallace Hamiltonian, and that, it's, uh, that again is a wave function. So at each site omega of the honeycomb, it has to have a value. What is its value? Well, there's some parameter t times the sum of the amplitudes uh, at the three nearest neighbors. This t is called a hopping coefficient. What is it? Well, all right, we'll see. Now, just like the continuum problem, the Wallace Hamiltonian is invariant under translation by the honeycomb lattice. And so the same Fourier uh, analysis applies or the same block theory applies. And so any wave function can be written as a superposition of wave functions with quasi-momenta, pseudo-periodic. And, so, and the, the Wallace Hamiltonian decomposes uh, as, a, uh, as a superposition of Hamiltonians acting on each quasi-momentum independently. And, and so uh, therefore what we want to do is to find the dispersion relations in, in the red box here. And we want to find these functions uh, for each, for each uh, uh, quasi-momentum K in the blue Lua zone. Uh, however, there's some good news that makes this uh, a back of the envelope calculation instead of, uh, instead of a math problem which is that if you look at the space of all wave functions with a given quasi-momentum, it's two-dimensional. Two, because there are two kinds of points, red points and green points in, in the first drawing, okay? So, um, and, and so the dispersion relations from the Wallace model can be found explicitly by doing elementary calculations with two by two matrices, depending on the parameter K. K varies over the blue Lorentz zone. Okay, and the result is that there are two dispersion surfaces uh, called E plus of K and E minus of K. And they are simply plus or minus this parameter T times W of K for an elementary function W, which has the interesting property that the vertices of the Brillouin zone form Dirac points. So, so the, these, this double, these two surfaces look like uh, a double cone near the uh, asymptotically as you approach the, uh, the, the vertices of the Brillouin zone. So that's the Wallace model for the bulk. Uh, we'll talk about uh, graphing with a sharply terminated edge uh, later, time permitting. Uh, but now I want to ask, what is the relation between the Wallace model and what is the hopping coefficient? All right, so now I have to be a little more specific than before about what our potentials are. Instead of just specifying uh, symmetries, 
I'm going to say that our potentials are superpositions of atomic potentials. So this, our potential V is the sum over all the sites of a honeycomb of a, a coupling constant. I'm changing notation. The coupling constant is now lambda squared instead of lambda. Um, but I have this atomic potential translated uh, uh, to each center uh, in, in the honeycomb structure. Okay. And we're interested in what happens when this V0 is fixed and lambda is large compared to one. So, um, I, uh, all right, I, I have to make some assumptions about this potential. Um, let me list the assumptions. First of all, it's, this is going to be invariant under a 60 degree rotation about the origin. Uh, let's say it's negative, but, um, but let's say it's greater than or equal to minus one. Again, this reflects laziness. We could make a Coulomb singularity if you like. Um, and V0 is supported in a little in a little disk about each so so the v is supported in a union of little disks about the atoms the a is 0.3 times the distance between nearest neighbors in the honeycomb curiously not one third uh, but 0.3 because of some elementary geometry that i don't have time to get into um okay uh now uh, the, the V0 gives rise to an atomic Hamiltonian where you, you don't sum over translates, you just take a single V0, think of a single atom with the nucleus at the origin, there's the Hamiltonian. The ground state should satisfy that. That's the first assumption that rules out the potential V0 equals zero, okay? And there is at least some gap between the lowest eigenvalue and, and the rest of the spectrum. So there's, I'm assuming there is no spectrum between the lowest eigenvalue and the lowest eigenvalue plus some constant that, that, that stays fixed as lambda is going to infinity. Okay, so here's a bad example. Imagine, uh, imagine that one atom, here's the origin, imagine that one atom uh, consists of these six rotated copies of, of this potential. It, it would be very unreasonable to represent a state of that system by one complex number. Uh, it would be much more reasonable to represent it by six complex numbers. And, uh, um, and if you think about the, uh, uh, the, the hypothesis on the energy gap, uh, that will happen. Okay, so if you make all of those assumptions and you take uh, lambda large enough, then, uh, then we can say something. All right, a uh, little more notation, sorry. P lambda uh, is going to be the ground state eigenfunction of the atomic Hamiltonian normalized to have L2 norm one, let's say it's sine is positive, that's P lambda. And then, all right, given these guys as above, we form this uh, potential, we study, uh, we study that Hamiltonian, um, and we look at the two lowest dispersion surfaces, okay? E plus and E minus. And the theorem is that for a suitable, um, uh, energy, depending on lambda, if you take if you take the two lowest dispersion surfaces, recenter them by subtracting this constant, and rescale them by by dividing by a number that I'll tell you about in a minute, then that converges to plus or minus w. These this plus or minus w, those are the two dispersion surfaces from the Wallace model, and the number rho lambda is this overlap integral, which is which is defined in terms of uh, the ground state atomic eigenfunction and the translate of the atomic eigenfunction to a nearest neighbor, as in the picture. Okay, so that rho lambda is the hopping coefficient. So we've, we've succeeded in showing that the Wallace model agrees with the one electron model and we've found the hopping coefficient. And also near the Dirac points, if you look at this recentered, rescaled uh, uh, dispersion surface, you get uh, oops, another correction, plus or minus um, this, this thing. Okay, so, so we've succeeded in, in recovering the Dirac points for, for the one electron model. That's the end of theorem three. All right, now I think I had better zip very carefully through what's left. Oh dear, two minutes. Oh, oh, it's conceivable that I'll make it. Um, remember, so in the set, let's, let's be in the setting of theorem three, and let's suppose that this Fourier coefficient is negative. I assure you that often happens, okay? 
Now, theorem three says that for large coupling constants, we have the Wallace picture. And so it is the two lowest dispersion surfaces that form a Dirac point. However, we've seen that under our assumption on, on the Fourier coefficient having the wrong sign, if the coupling constant is small, it's not the first and second, it's the second and third dispersion surfaces that form a Dirac point. The first dispersion surface doesn't intersect the second and third, okay? So now imagine, imagine that you have a knob and you are continually, you're continuously turning the knob. As you transition from large lambda to small lambda by, by, continually, by continuously varying lambda, uh, what happens? How can you get from one situation to the other the only way it can happen is that, is that the Dirac point with the first and second uh, uh, surfaces meeting uh, has to pass through the third dispersion surface at some point. And for that value of lambda, three dispersion surfaces meet. And in fact, they are the first three, okay? Uh, and so as promised, this set E is non-empty. And so the, this key Fourier coefficient and the, dis and the discussion of, um, uh, the, the discussion of domain walls leads to uh, the, the mysterious E. Finally, in the, whoop, it's, it's uh, 12 noon, I will finish the sentence. One can, one can prove that, that uh, uh, for the zigzag edge, but not for the, um, not for the armchair edge, that, ed, that edge states form in the one electron model uh, as for the Wallace model when the coupling constant is sufficiently large. Okay, it's 12 o'clock, thank you. Perfect timing. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much for the lovely talk. All right, oh, so I will give you Zoom applause. <laughs> okay. And then the floor is open for questions. Okay. So Alicia, could I ask some questions first? Go this for is it. Shankar. This is Shankar. Uh, so this was a wonderful talk, and uh, you. you are indeed correct. I understood most of it. Oh, good. Uh, but uh, which you know which. Either, I, I think I know the reason. You are just a fantastic uh, explicator. I first thought maybe my math is stronger than it is, I thought, but actually it's because you explain things very well. So first, a quick comment, it's uh, totally relevant. In condensed matter physics, we actually don't call that Wallace model, we call that tight binding model. Oh, because, sorry. Yeah, it's okay because, you know, tight binding is general name of doing band theory when mm -hmm. in your language and the coupling is very strong. You take the general Schrodinger equation on the lattice, mm -hmm. So there is a periodic potential, as you said, mm -hmm. and you are, of course, solving that whole problem. Mm -hmm. In condensed matter, typically, if you take a material like sodium, mm -hmm. that coupling in your language is very weak. So then mm -hmm. we use a nearly free electron approximation. We call that nearly free electron. And when the coupling is very strong in your language, mm -hmm. we use type binding approximation. That was already well established. Although mm -hmm. Wallace's paper was before I was born, but by that time, uh, uh, before yeah. even I was born. But by, by that time, tight binding approximation was very, very well established. It's one of the first things people did after quantum mechanics came along. Mm -hmm. So so at first I did not know what you meant by Wallace model. I thought some mathematician did it. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. No, that's okay. Absolutely all right. I mean, okay. You know, it's, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Very, so, so, so does does the tight binding model precede Wallace? Uh, by about 30 or 35 years, yes. Wow. Wow. Thank you. I had no idea. Not for graphene in general, that's very little too. Okay, okay. Huh. Huh. Now, the, now the questions, you know, I'm just going to ask two questions uh, about the future possibilities, you know. You, oh, uh, yes. Okay. One is that one of the things that is of great interest right now in graphene uh, community, and it's in fact of importance in all of physics, is that you take two of these uh, honeycomb lattices that you're talking mm -hmm. about, exactly two sheets of graphene. Right. And you put them on top of each other. Right. Rotating them slightly with respect to each other. So mm -hmm. now you have a new variable in yes. addition to your, uh, to your honeycomb parameters. Honeycomb Correct. is characterized by two parameters, C1 and A2, two lattice constants. Right. Now you have a third parameter, the twist angle mm -hmm. with respect to each other, right? Yes. And you allow coupling across the layers also. So you have a new coupling also, mm -hmm. because in general, you're putting them very close to each other. There could be hopping in the Wallace language in between them. In your language, there'll be new coupling. So this is a new system now. And this thing is called twisted bilayer graphene. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if you look into you know, any kind of bibliography, you'll find that it may very well be the most studied subject in all of physics right now. Wow. You know, it competes with black holes and you know, black hole information. Mm -hmm. And given that condensed matter is a huge subject, 
Uh, in fact, Colombia has a huge group, Cody Dean and Jim Hohn doing things. Mm. Princeton has a huge group, Ali Azdani doing it. It's, it's just a very big subject. Okay, so that's the background. What can you say about a system like that using okay. your powerful mathematical tool? Well, because well, you yeah. see, the thing is, it's a very interesting system mm -hmm. because it's, it's irrational now because for general alpha, mm -hmm. there is no reason that you have periodicity, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but what we physicists do, since we cannot really uh, work with irrational numbers at all, mm -hmm. we make an approximation, we make some kind of a continuum approximation mm -hmm. where basically it becomes a lattice, but now that unit cell is much, much larger than the original honeycomb. It depends mm -hmm. on the angle. Sure, sure. And you have a much larger unit cell. Right. And all the interesting physics experimentalists are observing arising from the fact that unit cell has increased in size. But in reality, there is no unit cell. Unit cell is the size of the system because you know it's always irrational. Sure. But you can take an irrational and make an rational. So this is a system of huge interest now. And in the context you are talking about, we really don't know much about the band structure of this system, except in this continuum approximation, where you assume it's really like a periodic system. So it's not something you'll be able to say, even you will be able to solve, you know in real time as we are talking, mm -hmm. but it's worth thinking about you and your colleagues, you know. Um, oh, okay, thank you. So, so um, I, I, I was aware of the existence of, of the problem. Uh, I certainly regard it as very, very, very interesting. I did not know that it was as big as, as you said. Um, uh, let's see, um, in fact, Michael and I, uh, and and uh, and another another colleague uh, Sonia um, are are thinking about um, a much much simpler system, which, however, has in common the fact that that the natural cell is is getting very big uh, of the order of the size of the whole system. It is it is simply uh, um, let's take the tight binding model of graphene. Okay, let's not worry about uh, uh, continuum wave functions, just just uh, um, uh, one um, uh, just tight binding, but with an irrational edge. Um, so a natural thing to do is is in that setting to try to approximate the irrational uh, edge by rational edges. Yep. So that that means that means that you have to understand rational edges where, so to speak, the relevant rational numbers have huge numerators and huge denominators in, in uh, lowest terms. Yep. The good news is that on some level we, com I mean, it's a slight exaggeration, but only a slight exaggeration. We now completely understand uh, uh, such, such rational systems. Do, okay. do you have a paper on this? The reason I'm asking is that uh, I was smiling when I'm telling me this. I, I, I sent you a paper because I thought that's yeah. what you'd be talking about because I didn't oh, know what you'd oh, be talking oh, oh, about. Okay. The paper oh, I sent you yes. is exactly uh, the, in the same spirit of what you described as what you did. I said to my student, we can't solve that 2D problem. I can't even visualize okay. the rational number. I can visualize it barely uh, along the real line. So let's just take a one dimensional system, purely 1D system. Okay. okay. Forget, purely 1D system. And then I can take two two potentials, you know, like you yeah. have just V of X. Yeah, I yeah. can add V, I have exactly the same Schrodinger uh -huh. uh, spec operator that you have, you know, uh -huh. the Laplacian plus V you have, we have plus V1 plus V2 uh -huh. okay? in 1D, so just K, X. Okay. And V1 and V2 are irrational with respect to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we said, oh, this is an incommensurate system and we can ask, mm -hmm. so you did it on the edge. We did it on a strictly 1D system. Mm -hmm. And we also found some interesting, we of course did not do math, we did physics. And mm -hmm. then when you could not do theoretically, we just did it on a computer. And the okay. results are precisely what you said. You take it rational and mm -hmm. what we found, results really depend mm -hmm. on what level of rational approximation, Diophantine approximation are making to this irrational. Oh yes. Okay? Oh, and yeah. this has experimental consequence because in this twisted bilayer graphene, Mm -hmm. Different experimentalists find different answers. The band structure clearly depends on which sample you're looking at, mm -hmm. which laboratory is looking at it. Now, they are generically not different, but de details are different. And I personally think what is being reflected is this fact that different labs are doing different rational approximations to these rationals. Uh, you know, it, it, they're all doing measurement. 
This so you are right in one okay. D. So do you have a paper on this one D H T? All right. We will. We, all right. We will. Oh God. Um, I mean, the 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 short answer is no. Uh, we have. Um, uh, I mean, I I think we will probably have a paper in the next few months. I'm afraid that's the. That's the time scale. I thought in math it's about take five years. That's what Michael Friedman told me. That that, that a paper takes much longer than doing the work because you okay. have. <laughs> all right, then in that case, oh, oh, all right. Uh, thank you, thank you for that comment. So I, I will say that we are <laughs> lightning fast, and we'll probably have a paper out in a few months. I'll be very interested in. Now okay. I have a second uh, question. I was wondering if you can do it. This is even harder. Suppose you do exactly the problem you just did with your colleagues, but you add a second electron. You had just so you're doubling the Hilbert. Oh yes. Oh okay. yes. You add a second electron and you do everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you just do everything you're doing, the second electron is not interacting with the first electron. Well, there is not much to do. Sure. But suppose you have now a new term mm -hmm. in your Hamilt in your Hamiltonian in your Schrodinger mm -hmm. equations. It's now a Schrodinger equation in four space variables. Each electron mm -hmm. has its own mm -hmm. space two-dimensional vector mm -hmm. at a time. Mm -hmm. And these two electrons interact with each other. So you have to add a term in your Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. which couples vector corresponding the first electron to the vector coupling to the second electron. Is this even approachable from the kind of math you are doing? All right, because so this will be the beginning of the interacting problem, something of great interest to physicists. Okay, so I'm going, I'm going to guess because we have not, Michael and I have, have not worked on it. And, and, um, and, and so anything I say, is is you know is definitely subject to, to doubt, but I would guess we could do uh, two electrons. That would be very uh, interesting. If, if you know uh, ten to the twenty six electrons, no, we no, no. Are, we cannot do. But but two electrons, I I would I would guess. This, this is a very important question because oh. interaction may destroy your Dirac cone and things like that. And uh, my speculation, we have done a lot of work on it using quantum field theory. You know, mm -hmm. infinite number of electrons. Mm -hmm. And we do find quantum phase transitions, but never mind that. You know that we do just various normalization group type things. Mm -hmm. But if two electrons can be done exactly, it will definitely have implications for physics. Oh, okay. So, um, oh, oh, all right. Let us be in touch. I would be curious to know uh, a candidate potential for the for the interaction between. Oh, the Coulomb, 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 Coulomb. But you can you can regularize it if you if you need to. It okay. Can be Coulomb, Coulomb potential, but it's okay to regularize it. Okay. okay, Michael. Michael, are you still there? Shall we let, let, let's let's start we, talking? We can talk questions. offline. We can communicate on email. I'm very interested in this question, okay. and there okay. good. is some work. Okay. All right, I'm going to let others know. I'm going to go off offline and listen. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. To to be continued. I'll be here. I'm just going offline to listen to others. Oh oh oh. oh okay. Okay. Um, regarding your question about edges. Mm hmm. There were some issues in three-dimensional crystals, equilibrium crystal shape. Mm -hmm. what, what you're doing, I presume, is a zero temperature analysis. And at any finite temperature, these so-called irrational states, which are, I mean, so facet states have uh, Miller indices, which are rational mm -hmm. numbers. You can mm -hmm. put in irrational numbers then and get those states. There's really no particular difference. It's a rough surface. And so having rational or irrational doesn't really matter. Um, in the model you're studying also, you don't allow any rippling, I presume, of the graphene. So there's some underlying potential normal to the plane that's holding it flat on the plane. So it's not just strictly two-dimensional. There's some external potential acting on it. So you don't have all the theorems that apply to pure two-dimensional. So it's more like three-dimensional. Um, so really what happens at, at, at zero temperature, you have a bunch of uh, those rational states. And once you get to a slightly higher temperature, most of it becomes a smooth uh, shape. Um, it's called a rough surface and the correlation functions are completely different between uh, the edges. Um, physically also there's gonna be reconstruction that these aren't, this isn't a rigid lattice, the carbon atoms near the edge are gonna distort slightly. So proving strict theorems may not always be relevant. Oh, um, in, in general, 
so let me just repeat. I, I wonder, um, maybe I didn't say this during the talk. It, it happened in, maybe in the run up to the talk. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm a mathematician. Somebody hands me a model and says, uh, physicists are interested in this. And I scratch my head and I say, gee, what can I say about this? This looks of interesting. Course. But I, I mean, I, I make absolutely, you know, I am absolutely not competent to discuss any, any possible correlation between what I've been talking about and reality. Okay. That's your department. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's our problem. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Great talk. Thank you. Um, Alicia, this is Jay. Could I ask the next question? Go for it. Uh, so, hi, Charles. Yeah, so, uh, so the, the, uh, I was very curious. Uh, I, I found the, the sign change of lambda v going from positive to negative making a di the, such a difference, mm. like, very intriguing, because usually we talk about only the positive part. I think the I think, think the negative one is very naturally realizable in cold atoms. So, uh, but again, and, and th there are other people here in, in the experimentalists in the audience who, who should be in the audience who who would answer that who would know that better. The question I was wondering was uh, this this uh, this exponential decay time that you were talking about. So basically, my my understanding is that you get a you 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 get a Dirac like state that coexists with other states. And um, and the bound state that you get from gapping that Dirac state out could decay into other states. But so is this picture only valid if you have a smooth domain wall? Uh, I, uh, um, that is what was oh, that, that's what I would expect. But I wanted to double check. I, I wasn't okay. sure. Um, here, wait, wait. Let let me let me switch from uh, from the document camera to uh, uh, to a human face. Wait a minute. Um, there. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, so if the Fourier coefficient has the sign that causes us to suspect uh, a resonance, then then in fact we cannot prove anything. We uh, you know we have guesses based on the fact that that there is not uh, that that if you look at the relevant energy that it intersects the dispersion surface someplace else. Um, but but we don't have anything even even for the case of the smooth domain wall. If you ask, if you, uh, I'm, if you get away from the regime that I was talking about, I know right. even less. Okay, oh, so I, it's just I don't know. Ah, uh, well, I guess perturbatively. Yeah. I mean, per perturbatively we can guess. I mean, in, in my view, okay, my understanding, I mean, I guess Alicia asked this question of an I, and you were going to discuss the answer more, but I made up a guess for the answer. To me, I think the answer to Alicia's question is yes, this potential W basically produces an imbalance between the two sublattices, among other things. That gaps out the Dirac cone. And then, uh, at least for small mass, this Jakiv Rebbe theorem tells us like if there's a mass change of the sign is in the Dirac cone, then you produce a bound state. Um, so for, for positive lambda v, that, that makes perfect sense. For negative one, I guess, yeah, that analysis is, uh, yeah, also probably a little bit problematic. I, I'm talking about this heuristic okay. kind of analysis. Okay. Um, but okay, that's, that's, very, that's interesting. I, I, I'm so, not aware, I have not heard right. this story before. I yes. think <laughs> it, it sounds like what's going on in the sort of nearly free limit with the sign changes. If you draw the nearly free band structure, there's a bunch of crossings that are Dirac cones. And if you change the sign of the perturbation, you change sort of which one you open into quadratic and which one is the Dirac cone. And it does it in the first crossing versus the second with the sign. And that's why you get the Dirac cone in the upper bands instead. Um, so I think like- but then, mm -hmm just for maybe context for Charlie, like I think there's, there are some physics models for thinking about gapping the Dirac cone in graphene where you introduce a modulation at the K that couples the two Dirac points. And in, in one sign of the modulation, you open up a gap and the other, you sort of push the two bands through each other and you open up a gap. And in the latter case, there's a bound state in between. Uh -huh. And so, 
in if, if you do the nearly free bands, then they cross at sort of different energies. And mm -hmm. I guess you're sort of, the sign is setting which ones of these open in which direction. I think, but I'm not sure that I understood what you said. So, uh, and, and okay, if I understood it correctly, then yes, it, it seems consistent with, with what Michael and I did. Um, I, I had another question. This is uh, Jim Freerichs. I'm at, uh, actually at Georgetown University. Um, there's another generalization that you can do of the work that you've been looking at, which is to add an electromagnetic field, which changes your gradient to, you know, essentially, uh, oh, yeah. you know, subtracting electromagnetic field. There's a lot of interesting stuff regarding whether or not you can open or close gaps depending upon the specific kinds of electric fields that you can put on, such as if you could put on electric fields that have circularly polar polarized light going in, mm -hmm. you should be able to open up gaps and, and so forth. So there's actually, a, you can stay entirely in the plane and even not go with edge states and have some very interesting things to study for essentially your bulk planar model if you're willing to go into the time-dependent regime and look at time-dependent electromagnetic fields, which might be something that you can handle with the techniques that you're using. I'm not completely sure, but uh, I just thought I would mention that as well as another possibility. Thank you. Uh, we, we have looked, we in, include somebody else, Jacob Shapiro. Um, we, we have looked at what happens when there is a strong magnetic field, which is, so let's say we're, we're, um, uh, we're in the regime where, where the tight binding model um, should predict what's going on, but there's also, uh, but there, there's also a, a magnetic field, but not, you know, not, uh, um, just, just in addition to everything else, a magnetic field whose, whose field strength is comparable to the, um, makes its effects comparable to the effects of the potential. And, and that's an interesting business. And we have first results, just, I could say first results on that, but, but it needs to go a lot, uh, a lot farther. What, uh, now you said, but you said electromagnetic. So, um, I, I now of course, um, we look at potentials, um, but but you, you want, you, you, I mean, when you talk about electromagnetic fields, the electro part maybe modifies the potential or makes it time varying. What so it, it, of course, things depend on your gauge, but the minimal coupling in your model, because you're adding the full periodic potential, you just take, uh, in the quantum mechanics language, you take P goes to P minus E times A, and then yeah, you sure. can add a scalar potential on top of that. Mm -hmm. And but the a is now time. It's a time dependent function that you add to uh -huh. it. So you uh -huh. lose the um, you lose the uh, um, time independent nature of the problem, mm -hmm. and that's what then generates a lot of very interesting behavior. I see. I see. We are we we are already uh, encountering um, lots of stuff when uh, when the magnetic field, let's say, perpendicular to the to the plane of the system. Um, is not time varying. When, when it is time varying, I have no idea what happens. 